All right, hello everybody. We're going to uh, reconvene the, um, we're calling it the LaSalle application <clears throat> that was continued from last month. Who wants to take the lead from your group? I, I will, thank you. Okay. So uh, first of all, thanks everybody for having us back, uh, giving us some time to work on a couple items. And I know you uh, stopped by to do the site visit as well. Um, we had a, a good planning, planning board meeting last week or a couple weeks ago and received conditional approval. A um, couple items that I believe we've already sent in and have, have those satisfied, um, but we have one follow-up meeting to confirm that. Um, so last zoning meeting, we reviewed all the approval criteria and a couple open items were uh, the odor and the site visit. So um, I wanted to cover the odor first. Um, you know, just want to reiterate how, you know, cl how clearly we understand the odor. And I think those around the call and the planning board are, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it's extremely important to us. Um, and we know it's important to the town. So we're going to do all we can to, uh, to mitigate the odor. And from an odor migration um, plan standpoint, that's going to be a work in process until we go live and the, and the renovations are complete in the greenhouses. Um, but in order to continue to move the process forward. The permitting and the zoning approvals are obviously critical before we uh, put a significant amount of money into the site. Um, so we, uh, we're, we're eager to move this forward. And um, last meeting, I believe we mentioned, we engaged a company called Buyer Scientific to help us with this plan. And we actually brought uh, Mark Byers, who's the founder and the president to the meeting tonight. Uh, wanted him to give a, an introduction of himself and his company and experience and then the board uh, we can open it up to questions and again i apologize for those who are on the planning board meeting it may be similar but we feel uh he did a great job at the planning board meeting and uh thanks again mark for for joining us tonight yeah thank you thanks thanks for the opportunity uh would you like me to discuss yeah, i guess i'd open it up to the room and would you like mark to give an intro or would you like to ask questions he can or he can kind of go um go into his, his spiel on how he would approach this and how we're going to work together on our order plan. It, it's your call. Well, an introduction certainly would be appropriate. His background, his um, credentials, and uh, what he wants to tell us first before we ask questions. Great. Sure. Okay. Well, my name is Mark Byers. Uh, last name is B-Y-E-R-S. Um, I would suggest everyone uh, visits our website, buyers-scientific.com. Um, I say that not as an advertisement, but because it's the most efficient way to really understand what the company does. Um, you get a, a very quick uh, introduction to our technology and, and uh, all the different markets that we work in. Um, we are arguably um, probably the largest uh, firm in the cannabis odor mitigation space in North America. Um, we're fortunate to work with uh, some of the largest producers uh, in North America, both in Canada and in the United States. Um, companies like Canopy Growth, you may be aware of, a uh, very large company. Um, we do all the cannabis odor mitigation for them and uh, in Canada, as well as their investment portfolio companies in the United States. And then as well as in Santa Barbara County, California, which you may or may not know, probably don't know, clear on the other side of the country, but it's the largest concentration of cannabis cultivation in the United States, maybe even in, in North America for that matter. Um, so we have uh, various uh, types of technology we bring to bear depending on, on the, the nature of the grow. Um, uh, one of those technologies uh, I have a patent on, on that technology. Um, what else can I share with you? Well, uh, significant. Um, if you were to visit the website, you would see the company is really made of three divisions, mitigation solutions. That's our equipment, our hardware. Um, and then the second division of three is buyer's emissions analysis. And I point that out because that is staffed and run by uh, two of the nation's leading cannabis um, emissions experts. That's uh, Dr. Will DeSuete at UNC Chapel Hill and Dr. Alex Gunther at uh, University of California, Irvine. They're both teaching professors. Um, Alex is a globally recognized air chemist. Um, he built models that the EPA 
still uses um, while he was at BPA and NOAA. Um, they're also employees of my firm as well as uh, shareholders. And so um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, uh, your time on this, but um, we're, we're, uh, we're all in good hands considering the depth and breadth of experience and ability we bring to the table. And um, I will position one last thing here for you all um, that I said on a previous meeting. And, and I, I, it's at the risk of sounding maybe a little disparaging to the um, permit that we're discussing here today. But if you were to compare the scale of this project to what we deal with on a, on a daily basis, meaning we deal in square acres, not square feet. Um, so this is a, a small project and, and I wish them to become a large project and I'm sure they'll get there. Um, but suffice to say, this is, this is a highly accomplishable mission with, with respect to the odor mitigation plan for this uh, proposed site. So glad to take any questions. So is there an actual plan, Mark, if I can call you Mark, please, um, that's been reduced to writing? That is in, in progress right now. I think as we understand, um, you know, this happens pretty consistently, actually. Um, permit applicants will generally come to a board such as yourself, and, and it is a, a bit of a back and forth as you work together to really orchestrate what is the best solution for all interested parties. And as you know, it's kind of an iterative thing. And so as we understand the scope and scale, then we can adapt even more precisely um, how we want to attack that. So it would be premature to say at the moment we have a, you know, a, a bona fide uh, scripted out approach. Let me ask you this <clears throat> without revealing any of the particulars. Has your firm been hired by these applicants? Yes. And when, well, there'd be some assumptions built in. Assuming we gave them their permit tonight and they had all their permits, which obviously we don't control them all. How soon would, it, how soon would you have a, a plan for them? Oh, I, I think when we, um, when the applicant knows precisely the approach that they want to take, and that's partly, I think, influenced by your direction, uh, turning that around is, is is very quick. Again, partly because of the the scope and, and scale of the project. That you know, there's we're not rebuilding anything here. It's pretty pretty straightforward. So very quickly. Yeah, just to add to that, I think as we as we formalize our, our you know, renovation project, I think that's going to bring to light a lot of the things where Mark's going to step in and say, okay, because we're doing this, we're going to need this type of uh, equipment to get, to get that going. And, you know, I think we'd be foolish to spend that type of, of capital investment prior to getting our approvals in place and, and permits. So that's kind of why we're saying it, it's going to work together. We're happy to move it forward. However, uh, you see, you see fit here, but uh, that's kind of our, when we say it's it's kind of a fluid process, that's what we mean by that. So when you say quick, Mark, so about six weeks, eight weeks, or longer. Ah, uh, well, yeah, I suppose you know you could use anywhere between eight and ten weeks as a rule of thumb. <laughs> you know that that. So you're in my terms. That's really speaking to how quickly is equipment manufactured for that particular installation. And that's a function of what is the equipment, um, you know. Um, so it, it's a quick. It, it's really no different than the typical ordering of a piece of equipment. There's a a standard lead time for that industry. That's kind of where we are. I would say, anecdotally, for anyone out there who's concerned about the economy, what we see in the manufacturing sector is there's a lot of demand for a lot of parts right now, um, which is. You don't see that in uh, in the news necessarily. You only see the unemployment rate. But I can tell you, someone on the ground, um, things are roaring right now, um, which is a good thing. Obviously, it's a good thing. But you know that feeds into our analysis. You know, are we six to eight weeks or eight to ten weeks? 
So what is the standard that you've been asked to accomplish? In other words, do you measure the smell by parts per million, parts per billion, uh, X number of feet off of the premises that you'd have uh, parts per billion reading? I'm only drawing on experience that we have as we approved um, Yankee Candles in town of Whaley. And, and so years ago, there was concern about the smell of the, um, the uh, wax and the uh, fragrance they were putting into the candles. And they had experts come and they told us, you know, a thousand feet away, you would, or their machine would not be able to sense the, the odor. Um, so, it's a, it's kind of a wide open question, but what have you been asked to accomplish? Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know if we've necessarily been asked to accomplish a particular thing other than what is pretty typical and standard. And it's the metric we would hold ourselves to. And that is, you know, certainly not detectable at the property line, right? Um, I would say, you know, looking at the nature of, of what, what we see is proposed, um, it, it's really, um, well within reason to, you know, mitigate 80 to 90% of everything inside and then, uh, meaning within the grow space. And then it's very typical for us to then, um, pick up the straggler, so to speak, and, and ambient air. Um, and then by that metric, by the fence line, I mean, that's the standard we really have at, on every cultivation, quite frankly. And that's, what's typical for nuisance odor, right? The, irrespective of, of what the emission source is. All right. So that's good to hear. Um, I know the other board members probably have some questions. I just, um, I understand the complexity of spending a lot of money to get odor mitigated before you've got the permit. But it's also been concern of the abutters and um, members of this board um, that odor be mitigated and done really, really well. So, you know, we're kind of caught in some sort of symbiotic relationship here. Um, but I'm not sure at what point my comfort level grows um, regarding odor only because as I would said before, and I will say again, we don't have on the ground experience in our town. Everybody promises that odor is going to be mitigated. Everybody promises that at the property line, you won't have any odor, but we don't know based on experience, whether that's going to be true. So that's where I am. Mm -hmm. And I think in response to that, I think it's appropriate to put the proper pr precautions or, or conditions in, in your approval that, you know, ensures that we comply with, with whatever the town sees as an appropriate, you know, measurement level. Um, the planning board did refer to bringing in some type of outside individual to monitor the odor for a time period uh, to make sure that we are complying with what we said we were going to do. Um, Mark's made it clear that, you know, if we don't technically follow exactly what he recommends, um, he doesn't really want anything to do with the project. You know, he's got, he holds himself to a pretty high standard. Um, certainly doesn't want a project of this size to ruin his reputation. And I, I think we, we take it very seriously because we've been saying this for months now. Um, you know, I, you know, I don't, no one really knows me in this meeting, but I, I'm, I'm a man of my word. I try to keep my word. If I say I'm going to do something, I want to do it. Um, and that's the type of project we want to run here. I don't have any interest in um, going back on our word after we've we've told the abutters and told the neighbors a, a million times that we're going to do all we can do to to mitigate the odor. So, um, but I don't I don't think delaying is the answer because there's no proof or no project that's that's been in play yet. Um, we're eager to go forward here. We're willing to spend quite a bit of money getting the site ready, and it's it's going to you know, be a good project for the town from a revenue perspective. And we're, uh, we're confident we can get it done, uh, especially with Mark's help. So 
Yeah. One second, jump in just for one one quick uh, comment as well. Uh, so, uh, sort of uh, answer Bob's question. I think it would help um, if he understood a little in a little more detail some of the projects you've worked on in the past and the successes and measures of successes that you've had on those specific pro projects. In particular, the ones in similar climates to to what we have here. Uh, perhaps you could just speak on that for a minute, and that might answer some of Bob's question. Sure. Um, well, you know, we're, we work in uh, really a number of different climates, I guess, uh, um, near Niagara Falls, Niagara on the Lake in Canada, uh, Mirabelle, Quebec, um, British Columbia, um, to British Columbia, um, that was a 40 acre cannabis cultivation, um, in, uh, in Santa Barbara County, you know, we, we have, um, we have receptors within a couple hundred feet, quite frankly, uh, and less, I think, uh, one of our projects, there's receptors probably 50 feet away. Um, yeah, you know, so the, probably the easier, easier way to sort of characterize that is maybe describe the, the technology and, and why it's effective and, and, and how we would use it. So we really, you know, when it comes to odor mitigation, right, it, 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 it can be boiled down to some very pretty simple principles. Um, anything you can eliminate at the source, obviously that's way easier than trying to deal with it once it becomes a fugitive airborne emission, right? We can deal with that, but clearly it's a question of angles. We'd rather deal with it in the greenhouse, for instance. So. Um, carbon scrubbing, as an example, you may have heard of carbon scrubbing. Carbon scrubbers are um, a big deal in the cannabis industry. Um, we have taken that to an industrial scale. Um, we have, um, well, I would, I'd add one pretty pivotal thing here. So our emissions analysis division recently and, and there's a press release actually about to go out from Iowa State University. Um, we were collaborators with Iowa State and researchers in uh, Texas. And we have identified, really isolated and identified the prime odor causing compound in cannabis. The one that is literally responsible for the so-called skunky smell. And it's not so-called actually, it, it, there's a reason. It, it really is related to skunk gland. It's a, it's a sulfur. Um, that's a big deal for us because, um, I think the analogy I used earlier is it's one thing to go to the doctor and say, I, you know, I have these symptoms and he issues, you know, or prescribes you a broad scale or what they call it a broad spectrum antibiotic. And it kind of does the job pretty good, but it'd be nice if you knew more particularly what you were aiming for. And that's what we were able to achieve in really the last few weeks, which is the culmination of about two years of research. So now we know very precisely what it is that we're looking for. So that informs our chemistry and informs really, this is more of a science and physics question, but the, the carbon substrate that we use, um, we're now able to even measure more precisely what the adsorptive capacity is. I don't expect anyone here to be a physicist, but carbon or a chemist, but carbon um, relies on something called adsorption has to do with polarity and, um, and it traps molecules. Um, our most recent study or testing, I should say, we were removing 99.95% .95 of the particular thiol. Um, so it's one thing to know you're grabbing a lot of something. It's even more powerful um, to know we're grabbing precisely what we're looking for, trapping it. Um, but even more so being able to measure it because measuring thiols is a challenge. Thiols are detectable in parts per trillion. Um, so um, embracing the proper use of, I will say carbon is a extremely misunderstood and misapplied technology in the cannabis space because uh, too many growers back in the day will say, 
just sort of take for granted or take at face value, throw carbon up. But like many things, it's more to it than that. The substrate, the residence time of air through it, the matching of CFM, a number of things are happening here. Um, we're specialists at this and that's the fact. Um, and we actually partner with one of the world's leading air filtration companies, which is CAMFIL, C-A-M-F-I-L. Encourage you to look it up, CAMFIL, their Swedish company. And we exchange data now. Um, my firm's findings are helping to inform even further that part of their practice, cannabis that is, which is minuscule, but nonetheless, it means something to them. So um, we already know before we start really what our removal efficiency is. Um, that's why I was saying about dealing with carbon on the inside. And this is data we can, you know, we can share the math. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's important that you walk away with a, the confidence that we know what we're doing here and the data support it more importantly. So it's a pretty simple equation in reality that, a cannabis emission or a cannabis canopy, no different than, it could be a field of tulips, okay? There is a gas phase emission rate from that field of tulips, right? And you could measure that. Um, we do the same thing for cannabis. We can measure what its gas phase emission rate is. And what that means is, as you all know, um, you have a plant, conditions, meteorological conditions, heat, humidity, other things are, are causing gases to boil off. That's what we experience when we smell roses and everything else, right? So we're able to measure what that is. Um, so then we know the rate that, that emissions are coming off of it. Well, if we know we want to circulate air to capture all that, to really sequester, right? Well, then it's just a, simply a question of sizing. How many exchanges do you need versus what that emission rate is? then it's algebra. It's not even algebra, really. It's division, right? And so we size the number of scrubbers that are necessary to get the proper number of exchanges such that we know we are exchanging air at a rate equal to or greater than that which the plant is emitting. So we know we're getting all of it, but then the analogy would be, well, what if you're passing it through a butterfly net? You may be circulating at the right amount of times, but what are you capturing? right? Well, what we capture it with is the most advanced carbon brought forth in the cannabis space that there is. Um, and that is, I'll share with you, it's pretty interesting. So generally, carbon, um, when we talk about scrubbing, uh, relies on bituminous coal, and it's often pelletized. But, um, and that substrate may have an affinity for a certain type of chemistry, when it comes to, um, we'll say the, the chemistry of cannabis emissions, which are in particular, it's terpenes and thiols, it's the thiols, which are sulfurs that we're really interested in. Um, um, charred, activated coconut shell actually is, is much more um, conducive to this thing that I said earlier, adsorption. Um, if anyone's taking notes, this stuff gets thick. I, I get it. Go to Google afterwards, look up adsorption, uh, look up something called Van der Waals forces, look up the London effect. These are the things that we're dealing with, but this is our, this is our backstop of why we know that activated coconut shell chard has a higher adsorptive quality than other things. And so then we can, so now we know We've got the best magnet, so to speak, to grab it. We know what the rate is that we need to circulate to grab it. And when I say circulate, right, imagine, imagine your house. If you don't open any windows and you don't have any air conditioning system and you have a fan in there, you're just recirculating the same air, right? That's really no different than the air purifiers. There's taking that same air and cleaning it and putting it back into the space. Nothing really new there. That's effectively what we're doing. Difference is we're sequestering those things that we don't want to smell in the carbon. So now we know the rate. We know what we're looking for. We know how to grab it. And the last thing is we can measure it. We can go back 
and take measurements. And I happen to have one, and this is not a prop. I, this happens to be sitting on my table because um, I was just in New Jersey at one of our clients. I'm in Santa Barbara and I was in New Jersey this morning um, uh, taking air samples. Um, those will go down to our lab at the University of California, Irvine, and we'll pull samples. We'll pull off of those cartridges and see what the upstream and downstream differences are. And we already know what we'll see, what the removal is. So that part's important because when it comes back to, you know, this metric. So um, the gentleman I spoke with that, that posed the first question, I apologize, I, I didn't get your name, but, um, you know, you were asking, how is it measured? And, you know, we can't really, um, there is no yardstick for odor, unfortunately. Odor is a subjective thing, as you probably know. The EPA doesn't even publish standards, right? Because it's a nuisance, but the EPA doesn't care about nuisance. The EPA cares about danger. If it's a dangerous emission, we can measure it and, and there are metrics. When it comes to nuisance odor, it's much more difficult. Um, but what we can do is sort of uh, ascribe a level, a detection level to what we're actually experiencing. Um, you had spoken in parts per million, billion, et cetera. So I'll tell you, thiols are detectable in parts per trillion. Um, they're very tricky to, to, to sample, to grab, um, and then see, and we are able to do that. So we'll likely, this is very typical of what we do, we'll craft the right uh, plan that works for this particular grow. The math will sort of support what our removal efficiency is, but then we can come back, you know, really it's, it's really only a question as the, as the cultivation starts to get into flower, but we can come back and take these samples and present what the data indicate. This is what the amount is in the air. And that's fairly easy to equate to an odor detection threshold. That is really, you know, the only other um, approach that is really, um, well, I would say it's admissible in court is an odor panel where we can actually come in and take a grab sample of air, uh, you know, handfuls of them and actually goes to a panel of people who are trained sniffers. I could give you a bunch of detail about it, but they, they, tr I mean, you know, if you believe a sommelier can distinguish between a number of different wines, it's the same set of sensories. Um, these folks are, uh, you know, they have to be able to detect certain gases at certain levels. They can't do, eat a number of different things when they have to do their work. Um, but their findings are ironclad and they're ultimately the arbiter of, you know, is an odor complaint valid really? Cause that's ultimately what we're aiming for. Right. So. Mark, on the planning board meeting, you talked through, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was San Francisco. I believe you got, you have a few clients that was at San Francisco or some, some place that had residential very close to the facility, uh, much closer than what we're <laughs> at here. Is that correct? Did I hear that correct? And, and that was well, very in, in Santa Barbara County. We have people it's very close. Sure. So my point of bringing that was up was that they were able to mitigate that odor in, in a much tighter area with residential butters far closer than we're at here. Um, but our, again, our goal is to have um, to the property line, um, no odor. So uh, hopefully that, that clears it up for everybody here. But if you, if you guys have any more questions, we're happy to, I say, I'm happy. I'm happy to have Mark answer on our behalf. <laughs> well, Neil or, um, or uh, Chris question. How exactly did the planning board make their ruling on, on this odor point? Has it been? So I think they understood that we were going to be working together um, as during the renovation progress and, and they were going to put in some type of measurement um, after the fact, I think once we're operational to determine if there's any odor and correct me if I'm wrong, Sophia, do you recall anything specifically that they had? Um, so good evening, Chairperson Lipton. Um, the planning board did um, offer approval on the petition based on what was presented both by uh, Mark Byers um, on Byers Scientific um, and as well as the additional supplemental information that Neil had prepared. 
that had also been provided to this board. Um, all their concerns about odor were addressed and um, the testimony was, was given at its face. So there wasn't anything additional. Uh, we are reviewing conditions with them, I think at their next meeting, but there was no specific standard or additional documentation that needs to be provided with regards to odor. They were satisfied with the testimony at the hearing. Thank you. So I, I hear you saying, okay, the, the goal is to have no odor at the property line. Uh, that's a goal. What are your chances of achieving that goal? The success rate, what is it? Are From you what I'm hearing, very- to 100% and there won't be no odor at the property line? Or is this a, what, 80-20 opportunity? I leave that to Mark. Honestly, I, I I'm not sure specifically. I think I think it'll be minimal, if any at all. But again, I'll leave it to Mark to, you know. So you can't commit to no odor at the property line. Is what you're saying? I think I would like to, but I would I need an expert like Mark to uh, to to confirm that. Um, that's our goal. But again, I think I think you brought this up last time, Mark. I think if um, we're going to do all we can, but I don't know specifically if it's going to be 1%. I can't, I can't quantify that personally. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you know, the, the challenge with that question, I certainly appreciate it. And we get that a lot. So there's a couple of things at hand. One is the reality in the physical world. Um, I would challenge you to find me something that is 100%, 100% of the time. It doesn't exist. The other thing though, even if we were, 100%, 100% of the time, we have zero control over somebody imagining, deciding, thinking that they smelled something, whether it is a skunk hit on the road, a hidden agenda, a, you know, an imagination or a fact, right? We don't have any control over that. So what we would rely on is the science that rather than, um, relying on, you know, uh, complaints, for instance, as, as the metric of success, we'd prefer to rely on data, right? Testing. What do the results say? What do the results indicate is the removal efficiency, right? That's really the ultimate metric. Now, I guess to answer your question, um, do we feel... I think it would be foolish for anyone to ever, you know, stand up on a box and say, yes, 100%, 100% of the time. That implies perfection at every step along the way. And that's why would anyone hold themselves or, or have to be held to that standard? A door can get open, left open. A door could blow open, for an example. Um, something can fall and break a greenhouse glass pane. And before it's able to be repaired, some odor gets out. There's a million things that can happen that could cause a faint and fleeting odor. Um, so that is, you know, just a, an unachievable standard in reality, right? Um, can we uh, hold ourselves to a standard that this will not be a nuisance property by most reasonable metrics, yes, yeah. Um, we understand, you know, as, as Chris said earlier, or maybe it was Neil, you know, um, everyone understands that SOPs need to be followed, right? Um, and we all have to be on the same sheet. And when that happens, we experience a tremendous amount of success and we wouldn't be doing the amount of business that we do if it were otherwise. And the filters would have to be changed on a certain schedule, would they not? They do. Yeah, and we have technology for that. We, uh, the filters, I would not call them filters, but the, the canisters, there's a number of carbon canisters in each of the scrubbers. Um, if that's the approach we take, which probably will be, um, we can take those out. We can take one out. We send it down to a lab in North Carolina. They do the butane life assessment that helps us understand how much of the carbon has uh, been used. It's not a linear relationship, but we do this all the time. Then we can start to build the metric of 
when the carbon is is reaching capacity. That's an easy one. Well, from the board's perspective, um, I just was reviewing the um, criteria and actually number five, which is of the standards noise and odors, says no noise or marijuana uh, or other odors shall be detectable at the property line. Um, so that is that is the standard. What we're wrestling with is, I think Bob, if I'm reading your mind, is, is wrestling with, okay, we have that there. You're going to be um, duty bound to try to achieve it. Do we ask for anything more to give us confidence going into this approval process that you're going to achieve it? Um, if I can pose that as the question, Bob, what do you think? Well, um, Chris, I want to thank you for bringing Mark tonight because, uh, well, I like listening to the science and, uh, Mark, thank you very much because your presentation um, really helped me feel more comfortable. Um, I don't know, Roger, if there's a, a, some sort of condition that can be just placed in terms of, of seeing some testing data X number of months out um, so that we can you know, just, just have a look at, at how it's working. But again, I, Chris, thank you. I, I mean, this has gone a long way. I wasn't suggesting before delaying. All I was suggesting is that I'm kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because I'll be one of the guys that that approved marijuana growing all over Waitley, and then all of a sudden, holy crap, none of this works. Yeah. So I'm feeling a lot better, and I appreciate it. Neil, you're shaking your head. I Yeah, I appreciate the presentation. Good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Well, I like, I like your idea, Bob, though. We can, why don't we stick with that? <clears throat> some sort of uh, time period, whether it be three months, six months after they begin operation, that they um, produce a report. Now we don't have enough. I don't. I don't have enough technical language. Yeah, language to say what goes into that report. Um, so that becomes a little bit of a quandary. Well. Although, I yeah, and I, I think also that um, it would be important to take a look at uh, early part of a growth cycle, then um, when it goes into bud, when it goes into blossom, and then slightly afterwards. I I I, I, th I think because it's the uh, you know the time when it's uh, ripest that it's ripest. Um, just from my little growth experience here in Massachusetts. Well, let me then. Let me um, flip the switch here. Mark, if you were sitting in my position as a board member, what would you want to see? And at what, what frequency would you want to see in, in terms of a report that, uh, that showed the, um, the lay people on the board that, that you guys were doing a good job? Well, um, thank you. That's a, I've never been offered this opportunity. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, well, you know, I think I would, I would, interestingly, um, you might accuse me of being in this case, the wolf guarding the hen house, but I can see from both sides of the fence, how I would craft that because I also, I know what, uh, cultivators, what standard they're held to really everywhere in North America. So what would be typical, um, is first off a, uh, a highly defined, um, complaints response SOP right? Um, that puts responsibility both on the cultivator as well as the complainant. Um, because odor complaints are an extremely valuable tool if they're not weaponized. The problem is, you know, they get weaponized too often. Um, and, and now you're forced to prove a negative. Um, in reality, you know, if, if people are honest about and, 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 you know, where, when did they smell it? Where were they? What time was it? Just give us that data point. Don't, don't, you know, not a bunch of hyperbole, just fact base. 
if we start to see if if this is something we're seeing and there's consistency there, clearly that's a super valuable tool. Um, so um, complaints at that time, it you know it, it's it's just very typical. You know, in Santa Barbara County, for instance, every single odor abatement plan requires verbiage and SOP by the cultivator what they're going to do, how they're going to respond, how quickly they're going to respond, what are their metrics going to be. Um, you know, how quickly do they get back, et cetera. Um, so that would be the first requirement is, is um, on the cultivator to provide in their odor abatement plan, what is their complaints um, response SOP. Um, at the same time, like I said, there's an onus of responsibility on, on you all as well, board members, or at least whomever has or with whomever lies that responsibility, because like I said, it, it's unfair to you and it's unfair to the cultivator for the complaints system to be weaponized against them. Um, the reality is, the reality is this is a somewhat nascent industry. We all know that there are people who don't necessarily support it. Therefore, they end up with a very powerful tool at their disposal that is arguably not always used fairly. So um, there's that aspect. I would then, um, if I had the magic wand, knowing what I know about what we do, um, a nice thing about the one of the mitigation efforts when I was referring to the um, scrubbing is that is highly measurable. Um, and so, um, you know, the metric would almost be, look, if all the SOPs are being followed, and by the way, we can prove a number of these things are occurring um, with our own technology. So every one of our systems leaves the shop with its own website, basically. So that means we can allow, if the cultivator agrees, we can allow every one of you access to the odor mitigation equipment on that site. Read only, we can't have you in there tinkering stuff, but you could go in and see that it's operating through a browser. You could pull down reports. And so then it starts to follow a pretty precise iteration. If we know for fact what the removal efficiency is of the carbon, we know for fact how many exchanges are necessary given this volumetric measurement, let's say, what are numbers we can do off the top of our head? We have 3,600,000 cubic feet, and we know that we're moving 36,000 uh, cubic feet per minute. We can do the math and we know precisely how many exchanges that is per hour. We can compare that to the gas phase emission rate and one plus one plus one has to equal three. You can't argue that. We take away that subjectivity. And so if we can demonstrate with data, the machine was running, the carbon is good, this is what it's running at, then it follows that this has to be the removal rate. So then the belt and suspenders is that the cultivators required then on a whatever basis. And of course that would have to be because I think it was Mr. Smith made the point, certainly early on in the veg stage, there is no odor. Um, and it is a, you know, it's a bit of a geometric relationship as the canopy comes into full flower. So, um, you know, we can come in at week six, take sample measurements. We can come in at, at week 12, do the same thing. And then I like the idea actually of even after harvest, get back to baseline. There is a, a very data-driven set of metrics based on a quantitative start to begin with. And when I say a quantitative start, I mean the, the initial infrastructure is, is not based on a wet finger in the air, but based on what the, what the science and the chemistry and the physics instruct us. So I would, I would assume odor is gonna vary like everybody is saying, depending on the, the what stage in the growing cycle the the plants are, and is it going to be 
I guess we're getting to growing. Is it everything going to grow at the same rate, the same time, and be harvested all at the same time, or is this going to be a continuous process where it's going to be harvested all the time? So the the opportunity for odor is going to be there all the time, and not just during harvest, whenever that is. Harvest is going to be all the time, I would guess, right? Yeah, I, I can take that question. Um, yeah, uh, to answer your question, we will we will have plants in the flowering stage of their growth at all times. Um, there will be periods. Uh, basically, I'm planning on having one house, one of the greenhouses, uh, you know, be for flower primarily. One of the greenhouses be for veg, and to sort of toggle between them. So we would have. Uh, you know, uh, we would have one harvest every six weeks. And at the beginning of, of each six period, six week period or shortly after each harvest, the plants would be in very early flowers. So there would be less, um, but they would still be in flower. And, and after a couple of weeks in flower, uh, the plants produce the odor. And Neil makes a, a pretty important point there. So you have to make the distinction of the entire canopy in one. So this is pretty typical, right? For an outdoor grow, for instance, outdoor grows have basically one harvest a year. Sometimes they can get a second one. Um, and so of course, let's say that's measured in, you know, we can be, we, we see 40 acre grows outdoor, right out here. So clearly that 40 acres can be in, in veg, you know, nursery and then in veg and it's slowly growing and there's really no odor profile. And, and yeah, of course, 40 acres at full flower is one set of conditions. But when you're in perpetual harvest, that implies that the, the mass that is in flower is considerably reduced, right? It's, it's um, you know, I don't know what deal, Neil's particular plan is going to be, but it's, it's really analogous to crop rotation, right? So as you're rotating right through the cycles, because you gotta remember it's, it's pretty easily, uh, now I'm speaking Neil's language here, but it's, it's all mathematically derived. The plant has a growth cycle. You have X amount of square feet. You're driven to what portion of that's gonna be in flower. That's a pretty standard growing operation. But the implication is that only a percentage of it is in full flower at one time, it, right? It's it's a much smaller amount. Obviously, that makes odor control a lot easier. Try doing forty acres in full flower. That's a heavy lift. Well, fortunately, we won't be anywhere anywhere near that. <laughs> All right, so I guess <clears throat> let me move as I normally do. Are there any abutters here who have any questions or comments? I have a question. I do. A butter, Mark Sobolski, 13 LaSalle Drive. Um, you've been, I'm not sure if you've been over there, Mark, but you know, obviously you're aware that the greenhouses are quite old, like, you know, probably I think in 80 years old or so in need of repair. Is there anything there that you see uh, that may be problematic or, or do you have any experience with odor mitigation with sort of retrofitting older greater greenhouses? Yeah, well, we've got a, unfortunately a lot of experience with that, with old retrofitted greenhouses. What I mean by unfortunately is that um, in a number of jurisdictions, um, it's pretty common for um, you, you, this is just a typical planning commission sort of constraint where you have a structure that exists and you have two choices, retrofit it and live with what you have or tear it down, start new. But when you tear it down and start new, that often puts you in a different set of circumstances. Now it's a land use permit as opposed to some conditional use permit, right? And then the, that, that causes more heartache. And so um, it, it, it ends up the 
the lesser of two financial evils is to retrofit the existing house. Um, and we're always kind of sympathetic to folks that end up in that position. Um, so that said, that forces us into often dealing with retrofitted greenhouses. The nice thing about greenhouses is, let's be honest, at the end of the day, these are not superstructures designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, they have stable skeletons. You pull off the Dynaglass, put on fresh Dynaglass. They're pretty easy to, to seal right back up if the, if the structure is solid. So it's not a heavy lift necessarily to refurbish. These are of a size, you know, I don't even think it's a significant financial lift to refurbish these things, right? They're, they're not that big. So that's, um, I, I mean, I, I think as, as Chris said earlier, um, you know, we, we wouldn't really probably even want to take on the project if we didn't understand that these things are going to be um, put in place, right? We can't have a leaky greenhouse because, um, besides the cultivator getting fingers pointed at him, then we're going to get fingers pointed at, at us. And I don't want that. So I know from our side of the table, so to speak with, with, with Chris and the team, we're all in the same sheet of music there. And uh, if I just may interject also the, our renovations, we plan on fully renovating these. So they will basically be brand new greenhouses once they're renovated. And, and just a, just a follow up comment, um, you know, and I, you know, certainly buyers, you know, Mark, very credible, you know, a lot of experience in the industry. Um, but I got to be honest, isn't a butter. I, I, there is a certain, a certain a sort of um, aspect of this that I'm uncomfortable with sort of an approval without seeing a odor mitigation plan. I know there are financial aspects involved. I'm just speaking from my perspective as an abutter and my parents and, and, you know, as the folks who will be living over there, um, with something and, you know, Chris certainly said you're a man of your word. And, um, but again, there's, a, there's an aspect of that, that just, you know, is, it is, is a bit uncomfortable for me. That's all. Oh yeah. I certainly understand that. I guess the way I would address that question or statement is, um, you know, just man to man. If I drew up the plan and showed it to you, I don't think it would necessarily mean a lot to you anyway, right? I mean, you wouldn't necessarily be able to put the value on what we're doing. Um, you know, when it, it's impossible right now to say what is the precise best approach, because we don't know precisely what the layout is going to be when we know. And, and I think that is a function of, these folks getting the green light when they know they're able to move forward, then they can start to craft out, okay, this is what the physical structure are going to look like. At that point, I can really easily sit down with you, with whomever, as they put their plan together and show, okay, so these are the volumes we're dealing with. That's really the main thing. These are the volumes we're dealing with. This is the type of um, ventilation that we're going to have. Then we can say, okay, all right, we're gonna use an atomization system on this. We're gonna use this particular neutralizer in this volume, we're going to be exchanging. At that point, um, this goes back to what I was saying a minute ago. Um, it, you know, not to dumb it down, it really honestly turns into simple math at that point. It's math based on a lot of findings that we have, right? We're solving to to answers that we we know, right? We know what the removal efficiency needs to be, right? With the number of exchanges. So now, once we know what the volumes are, we can put the right number in place. Um, I don't know if that helps you, but um, I guess uh, the one thing I would sort of leave with you, I, I don't, yeah, you know what? I guess if you do look at our website, by the way, um, you can see some of the scale that we work on. And I, I mean, it's hard for me to convey this to you, but this is a little project. This is really easily handled. It's just not, you know, it's just not a big project. Um, and I hope it, I hope it grows. Of course, you should all hope they're going to remit tax dollars back to your area, right? It, it, it's, it can be a very virtuous cycle. 
Um, but starting off, and then it's probably, you know, I suppose, um, now I'm sort of editorializing on your time, but um, it's a good opportunity for you to see a smaller scale, but it in fact can be, can be handled very well. And scaling is pretty easy, right? Um, it, it, it really is, it's, it's, it's just scale, so. Other questions, Mr. Sibelski? No, thank you. Any other butters present? Yes, I'd just like to say I am Mark's sister and I just wanna reiterate what I expressed to the committee, the board last week is that as a butters, we have no agendas. <laughs> we are not weaponizers. Um, we're simply Abutters, I like to think of integrity, who just want what's best for the neighborhood. When I say the neighborhood, I mean everyone. I mean the LaSalle's and the future of any businesses that come into the area. And I really appreciate the questions and thoroughness of this board and the follow-up of Canna Select um, in terms of addressing those concerns. So I just want to, to leave it at that, that we are not folk, my parents are not folk that would um, falsely claim anything that they did not detect and were not anticipating if this were to happen and with this efficacy, hopeful if this is to occur, that it would happen. So I just want to air out that we have, we have no offenses or anything, that we're just here for the, the best of everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Yeah, that's refreshing to hear, to be honest. It's just being human. <laughs> okay, so if there are no other butters, um, then from my perspective, it's a well thought out application. <clears throat> um, I'm glad we had the opportunity to view the premises the other day. The um, difficulty, if we were to approve the project uh, tonight, is putting the condition in place and, and writing up the condition that would deal with the future odor abatement plan, and that's assuming and I'm only one member and I'm not voting yet. That's assuming that we don't require an order abatement plan prior to granting the application. Um, but I think we can, we can have a level of protection knowing that that point 0.5 that I mentioned does already hold them to a standard. No odors allowed beyond the perimeter. And then if we, um, Perhaps consult some other um, projects that have had written odor abatement conditions and, and craft some of those ideas along with um, Mark Byers' suggestions uh, that we can come up with something that might satisfy all the concerns here. So those are my initial thoughts prior to voting. What do you think? Um, Oh, we should decide, actually, I should say this. <clears throat> Bob will be voting as a regular member. Between Kristen and, and Fred, who wants to vote as the third voting member? I will defer to Kristen since she's uh, in charge of the presentation here, this, the Zoom meeting, so I'll let her do that. All right, Kristen, okay. you're, Kristen you're nominated. Okay, I'm voting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's my initial uh, um, suggestion, which is really opening it up to the board. Um, Bob, I know you've got a, a lot of thoughts on this topic. What do you think? Well, I, I think that tonight has, for me, uh, gone a long way. Uh, and I understand the, uh, the complexity of, of uh, investing that kind of money into uh, bioscientific equipment. Um, and a plan before you know if you're going to be able to actually do it. But 
we've heard from abutters. Um, I'm very happy that um, the LaSalle family has given a tremendous amount to our town. And I'm very happy that it's sort of the, it, the heart of the LaSalle operation is going to exist, although in a, in a modified form as we move into the middle of the 21st century. Um, I'm glad it's still going to remain uh, a farm, although I guess Massachusetts doesn't call this farming and agriculture. Um, so there are many parts about this that um, I think are going to work uh, to the town's advantage and to sort of the history of the town, which is important. Um, I really like tonight's presentation a lot. I just don't know how we get to figuring out, as you said, Roger, figuring out a order of, of um, you know, stipulated conditions um, without maybe looking at some other places that had them to give us an idea of what to do. But I do like the idea that um, Mark gave us about a complaints response um, operating procedure kind of thing and putting the onus on Canna Select to um, draw up that SOP for us um, in part. So, um, I mean, I, th I, th I think I'm in a good place uh, about voting as long as we can figure out a way um, to deal with those conditions. Now, do we have any other conditions besides the one dealing with odor? As we went through this last week, they did a good job of, you know, going through all the bullet points and satisfying me, I'll say that. Um, well, I mean, is it, is it unreasonable to, um, the odor mitigation is all uh, buyer scientific. Uh, if, if they were unable to do buyer scientific, does that affect how we feel about odor mitigation possibilities? Well, that's a good point. We could make a condition that the <clears throat> applicant continue to work with buyer scientific and come up with a scientifically um, appropriate and industry typical solution. I mean, the words may not be those exact words, but... Uh, and then that puts the onus on them. If for some reason they can't strike a deal with buyer scientific, they would have to let us know and seek to amend their, their permit. So if we've gotten at least a comfort level, an initial comfort level with Mark Buyer and buyer scientific, we've at least uh, made a significant step. I, if I could make a suggestion Yep. Um, just um, with all due respect, as an observer in a, a number of these similar situations, um, now you could say you're shooting yourself in the foot, Mark. Um, I, I would suggest you avoid um, citing a particular company as a requirement because I would assume that your constituency would have cause to say you cannot endorse a particular company. I would love it, but I don't think that's a legal framework you want to maybe put yourself in. What would be more typical is to say that the permit applicant is required to employ BAT, best available technology. How is BAT, um, you know, uh, quantified or qualified? An example would be, well, what is considered best available technology in other similar markets? By that mechanism, I can demonstrate we are in fact best available technology in one of the largest cannabis markets in North America. I think that gives you, now I'm playing legal counsel to you and I'm not an attorney, but I think that puts you actually in a more tenable situation down the road um, and also provides the applicant the opportunity to, look, if someone comes along with better technology than ours, um, then the permit applicant should have the, the flexibility and, and the ability to, to go that route if I haven't already purchased it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, 
good point. Just another comment. Roger, I think in our, in our last meeting, I remember Bob and I were making the, the comment that we'd like to see some examples of how odor was being mitigated in our, in our state or in this Connecticut River Valley. We wanted to see something local that was being uh, a marijuana establishment that had odor and how it was being mitigated. What Mark is, Byers is saying, yeah, that's true for California and other parts that I didn't hear anywhere near near Massachusetts or in our in our in our valley here, and we asked for examples of that. I don't recall unless you guys on the board have seen more than I have to get any information on that. Well, I do I can provide the conversation. I think this is a board a board question for now. I, I, I guess Bob, have you seen anything more? No, no. But I also, I mean, I also think Fred that, um, you know, that putting in the um, as Mark suggested, the best available technology. <clears throat> I don't know if we're going to do better than that. If I mean, That's best available technology means exactly, exactly that. Right. So. And if this gives the board well, any other. Would you think somebody else has this in our area and they could tell us how they're controlling odor? I mean, we're not the only one dealing with, with marijuana establishments in this area in all of New England, right? I think you could go to a number of different locations around you guys we brought this up at the planning board but uh, grew up in the, the lennox lee pittsfield area great barrington have very successful uh cultivation and retail locations and they've had success with this so there's 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 precedent out there that showed that, that this is doable um and I, in, in addition to that when i can't even tell you what the process is going through the ccc to get a license is going to be very, very involved. And if we don't have everything in a row and the proper SOPs and odor plan, security plan, all that, we're not even going to get up and running. So there could be something put in place in he here um, that ties in with that to our provisional license or something like that. But again, I, I don't think the answer that is the best for the town is to delay this project any further. I think give us a chance to, uh, to do the right thing here and, and get our project up and running. And if we don't follow uh, the protocol, you have the ability to, you should have the ability to, to prevent us from continuing operation. I think that's the best recourse you have is to come in and say, you're not following the rules. And, and therefore we have to shut you down until you prove, prove otherwise. Um, in addition, we could have a um, odor mitigation plan presented to you prior to commencing operations. That could be another option here. But again, I don't, um, I don't see the need to delay this further personally. But again, that's not my decision. But I just wanted to bring those couple of points up as well. Well, I like the idea of the auto mitigation plan being presented prior to operation. To address Mark Byer's point, though, um, I don't see it as an actual problem and we're certainly not endorsing his company, but it, they've presented him as, I'll call him an expert witness. Um, I think the board have been, has been impressed by him. Um, I don't think it's a leap of faith to say they're probably gonna hire him. Um, we're relying on what he told us, ipso facto we should be able to continue to rely on what he said and that that, that odor abatement plan is going to be prepared by him. Now, if they, if they can't strike a deal with him, and that's, that happens in the business world, I understand it. They just come back to us and we'll have to have to address it. But at this point, it, he's the best we know of um, in terms of this project. We don't know if anyone else has looked at it that closely. I think that protects the board and the town. That's my personal view. So the takeaway there is two things, an odor abatement plan 
prior to the commencement of operation and it'll be prepared by, and we'll even say Mark Byers or, or someone of similar uh, stature. And that, that's kind of a, a loose, <laughs> a loose term. Similar industry that. standing. Yeah, but I, I just think we make it easy. prepare the plan, but I think Mark will assist us with it. It has to be our plan. Mark's probably just gonna say that, but uh, he made Yeah, that. well, if I could make a suggestion again, um, it's. This is probably a good opportunity for your town, township, county, whatever, to begin to start to set up what would be the typical proper protocol. Don't reinvent the wheel, right? Um, notwithstanding what Chris mentioned about other successful operations, the reality is cannabis is far, far behind in New England versus out West. So it's hard to find you know, examples, because not too many folks have gotten a permit. Um, so we see this over and over. Learn, you know, if I can humbly suggest, don't reinvent the wheel and learn what other municipalities have already been through. Um, for example, um, you should require, I would suggest, that all applicants, not just this, that all applicants, their odor abatement plan is signed off on by a third party, either PE, right, professional engineer, or certified industrial hygienist. That is becoming an industry standard across North America, as an example. Then that gives the permit holder, as well as the, the town, sort of, you know, cover that a third party unbiased arbiter has looked at the engineering and all the other things and says, yes, we, we agree. And it's they that are actually putting themselves at risk then before they're willing to stamp something. I like that. Big idea. Excuse me, Mark, what were the two titles you just gave for who should do this as a third party? It's typical, uh, what we, a PE, okay. professional engineer. Um, uh, it's we see over and over a CIH, a certified industrial hygienist. We, Industrial, okay. <laughs> yeah, I tend to put less um, emphasis on that um, just because of the space that CIHs tend to, you know, a PE is way more qualified. Um, but uh, that is, you know, if you're in an area that you expect that this is going to continue to grow, then this is the sort of protocol would be typical to, to build out. It, it's a it's a risk management tool for both the permit holder and for you on the county side or the you know town side yeah okay that's good so um it's 8 30 we have another hearing after this one so without further ado <clears throat> why don't I do this, which is uh, what I typically do. We're going to, I make a motion to close the public dialogue portion of the meeting and that we, the board members will continue to negotiate right here on zoom in public. Uh, so that's my motion. Second. Okay. So then unless we ask a specific question, all the other rebutters and the applicants and, and, and their, um, their allies will just listen. Okay, so I am prepared to vote in favor of the application tonight. I am in favor of granting it with a condition that there be um, an odor abatement plan submitted prior to the commencement of operations um, using best available technology and that it be signed off by an independent third party either professional engineer or CIH uh, certified independent hygienist. And that we will take some time to write that out a little, with a little more specificity, but those would be the, the, um, the highlights of what we would be approving. And if it goes without saying that they have to meet the standards that are set in the bylaw, which is the 0.5, we don't really have to restate yeah. that because it's already there. Um, so that's, that's what I would be prepared to do. 
And again, for everybody's purposes, for everybody's um, knowledge, this requires three votes unanimous in, in the same direction. Um, so Roger, we've just got one condition that we're voting on. That's my proposal, yes. That, right, okay. What about the um, complaints response operating yeah. procedure? That, we should should, uh, that should be part of it, um, part of their standard operating procedure. And again, this is where the words will uh, be important, but that there be, based on my notes of what Mark was saying, uh, defined complaint response SOP, uh, indicating where, when, and what time uh, a um, odor escape was, was notified was noticed and uh, that the SLP deal with how to respond to that. Now, do we want to um, say that in the development of the odor mitigation plan, best available technology should be employed? Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. With that, with uh, that, that we've just outlined, I would be prepared to vote um, tonight as well. And I also will vote yes, based on those uh, set of circumstances. So it's a yes for me too. All right, so those were, I was thinking out loud. So now we'll make, I'll make a formal vote. So I will cast my vote, a roll call vote is what's required under Zoom. Roger votes in favor. Robert Smith votes in favor. Kristen Vivon votes in favor too. Okay, folks, so that's it. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so we will, much. Yeah, we'll take some time to write this up, but it won't be, you know, won't be more than a month, that's for sure. But, you know, we have spatial uh, distancing uh, rules, everything else to deal with. So um, we'll get to work on it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Thank you. Job. Thank you, Thank you Thanks, all. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Stay safe. So the board will stay where we are. Is, is Tony present? Yeah, just. Yes, I'm here. Hey, Tony. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Hello. Well, we can we can get started uh, unless unless people need more time. Tony, we got your submission, which is a revised plan. Yes. So, is this still is this still a work in progress, or is this the plan you want us to uh, consider? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to apologize for missing last meeting. I got messed up on the date somehow, um, and. Um, we failed to get on. So I want to thank the board for continuing that uh, the hearing on our behalf. Um, this, I think from your standpoint, uh, it's, it's a decision that I think we could make this evening. Um, if you recall, when we submitted the last time we had two flag lots and in the time between that and the meeting that I missed, we got a response from the town council um, that in, in you know, statutory construction of the bylaw would state that there could only be one flag lot on a, on a parent parcel, regardless of the size. So even though we have a 91.3 acre parcel here, the bylaws that's currently constructed only allows one flag lot. So with that um, uh, determination, uh, if you recall, we had two flag lots in a frontage lot. Well, essentially what we have done is remove the frontage lot keep lot one as a, as a flag lot and make lot two a normal in our frontage lot. Um, and, uh, and it just increases the size of the uh, open space conservation lot or remaining area. So for a small project, it's been very, it's, it's quite difficult. There's a lot of parts and mostly where we've been um, uh, working with the um, uh, natural heritage folks, this whole lot or over 90% of the lot is within natural habitat area. So uh, you'll see on this plan, I don't know if you can bring it up, Roger, but uh, I'll try to um, 
describe this. This is um, considerably different from the first plan that we submitted. So lot one would be the flag lot. Lot two is a normal frontage lot with frontage and area. This is aquifer protection. So they have to be over three acres in size, which they meet. Um, a good portion of the lot to the north that fronts on Dickinson is all uh, pond and wetland area. That's that shaded area. So in our conversations with natural heritage to be able to um, develop the two residential lots, which would still be served by a common drive, that has not changed um, because that it's the least impactive um, way of accessing both lots with the wetlands that we have that cut across uh, uh, almost all of it. There is a little farm, um, you know, upland area that, that was created there years ago. So in order to cr uh, create these two flag lots um, and leave them open for um, development, uh, we have to do a, what natural heritage is requiring is a three to one mitigation. So you'll see out back of those two residential lots, you'll see a natural heritage conservation restriction of a 27.42 acres that, um, that would start out as a development restriction um, Usually with those things, there's some signing and monumentation so that um, that open space lot, which will never be developed, will be um, also have that restriction on it. So um, there's been a lot of discussions with them, uh, the wetlands folks. Um, so essentially, we've been continuing our, our local uh, to try to get them on. And I think we're now at the point where we can get back to the local uh, approval zoning um, planning board and um, conservation to get this plan approved. So um, we still will have some negotiations with natural heritage. I do need to get a conservation management permit, um, but we're pretty settled on the area. Um, and uh, so we would really appreciate it if the board would consider the one flag lot, which meets the requirements of the town bylaw. Um, as a special permit approval this evening. Um, if you're uncomfortable and want to wait a little while for the state permits, we would ask for a continuance. But if they change something, we would have to come back to the board. I don't see that, that flag lot being changed in any, any shape or form. So I, I think we're good to go on, the, have, on those. I don't know if it might have been unintentional. Your little flag there that says wetland conservation restriction. Yes, it blocks the fr the the distance of the frontage. How, how much? Oh, speed? yeah. I I think um, you know I'm going to ask Mark to chime in on this. He's on. He probably recalls what that is. It's over the 40 feet. Um, that's uh, the minimum requirement for flag lot. Mark, do you know what that number is? Can you can you pick that I'm up? I'm looking it up right now. <clears throat> Yeah, there's a lot going on there. We've got a wetland restriction and um, and we're supplying a 40 foot access and utility easement along the common drive, which will um, be utilized by both um, lot one and two. There's a maintenance agreement. Those are all planning board issues, but we've supplied the planning board with a maintenance and a covenant for maintenance um, agreement for that common drive. And while he's looking that up, so is that the proposed location of the house that I see the the um, rectangle? Um, they're just depicted. We're not, we haven't locked that down. So individual um, homeowner that buys that lot, um, the way we have this set up is we give them the ability to construct within zoning. Obviously, they can't get in the setback, but they can be anywhere in that lot. If we were to restrict the position of the house in the grading, so say we were to restrict it to one acre out of that lot, um, then we could definitely reduce the amount of restriction, but we're trying to keep it open so that say they want to move it a little farther to the north or something, as long as they're not violating um, setback requirements, they would be able to do that. They'll have to come back for a building permit and so forth. Um, for some reason, if on lot two, they push the building within the 100-foot buffer, 
um, they would have to go back to conservation to get that. Um, as we're doing here, we're just, we're fixing those lot lines for frontage and area, um, but not trying to restrict where the house is built. I mean, the, the, um, we do have at the edge of the wood line on both of those lots, we've done test pits and, and park tests, which um, uh, were passed uh, so that we have a good idea where the, um, you know, where the septic systems would go. Those could be changed too if they wanted to redo it all, but I don't see the why you would want to do that because they're downhill and um, those systems could be gravity um, uh, gravity systems, which make a lot of sense. You got anything, Mark? Yet? Um, it should be approximately forty six point six five feet, but I just want to confirm that. We'll be going to the. Um, to the planning board with an ANR um, to um, get that approved, um, uh, both of those lots. But I think it'd be better to have the special permit from 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 the ZBA before we brought that planning board uh, in our plan to them. And at this point, K on page 41, that should be maintained or kept naturally occurring or planted vegetated buffer zone between any flag lot and any front lot sufficient to provide privacy between the two lots. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that, Roger. Yeah, K on page 41. Yeah, about a go. vegetated buffer zone between the two lots. Yeah. What, what do you got between those lots? Trees or anything? Uh, well, they're all wooded right now. So, um, the Mark, what's the uh, side yard setback on these? Do you have that handy? On the, I don't have the construction plans. Um. I think they're 20, 20, are they 20 foot side yards? So essentially you'd have 40 foot between, you know, building setback areas. So that creates a buffer between the two lots. Well, it says a vegetated buffer. You're saying 40 It's feet all tree. With the trees, okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, it's all tree, that's all wooded. Um, it's open where the wetlands are, that's open meadow there. Um, that's been paid, I believe, for years. Um, it still was an open meadow when we did our test pits and all of that. Um, so with the side yard setbacks of 20 foot, I mean, so you'd have a 40 foot buffer between the buildings there. I wouldn't think people are going to cut the whole lot. You know, you know, they would probably keep some privacy there, but that would be um, right. in the development of the lots. And you're saying the, the ANR plan that you submit will show about 40 foot <laughs> Yeah, it's greater than the, um, we never, um, I mean, we, we've got so much flexibility, we would never bring it right down to the, the minimum just because things don't quite get built the way there. We're trying to run that lot line essentially down the middle of the, um, of the uh, common drive. And then we've got uh, a 40 foot wide access and utility easement over the top of it that both of those lots share. Okay. It's, um... Bruce Tootin available? Or is he yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Again. Bruce, so, so, yeah, so this is the first time I've seen this new plan. So there's no, uh, the, the, the lot that, that was originally on Masterson Road in the corner of Dickinson Hill and Masterson, that five acre lot is, is no longer. No. You just, you, you just decided to put two lots up, up in the woods. Well, the other area, we could have put it right at the frontage, but um, the area in back provides for more room um, because of the encumbrance of the wetlands that, you know, are pretty much right off the frontage of Masterson <laughs> and Dickerson. So um, yeah, from an well, environmental standpoint, I... it's, much, uh, it's much better to put it back there. Well, it's much better for you. It's not much better for the neighbors, I can tell you that. Now, I have a serious um, potential health concern uh, that you probably have not considered and nobody's considered, but uh, it has to do with wood smoke. Um, when the candidates built next to me, um, the first uh, coal season, they have a they they burn wood. Uh, the draft, the the way the air current drafts, it drafts. They couldn't blow the smoke into my house any better than if if they tried. 
it just drafts right down in this direction. Uh, now, Todd Sanford, Sanford up on uh, Dickinson Hill has a wood burning furnace and that drafts down to us too. He's far enough away, it's not a problem. Now the candidates were kind enough when I pointed it out to him. I mean, the smoke was at my back door. It was like, it was like fog, it was like London fog. So they were kind enough to um, uh, not burn wood whenever the weather was allowed windows opening. And I've, I've not had a problem with them because they only burn wood in the winter when the, the house is shut and that's fine. But Todd has a wood, wood burning furnace. Um, and I know Waitley allows wood burning furnaces, at least I think they do. If one of these people that, or whoever buys one of these lots decides to put a wood burning furnace in, our houses are gonna become uninhabitable. And I'm not blowing smoke, no pun intended. That smoke is gonna pour down and basically suffocate Ingrid and myself, and maybe even some of the other neighbors. Um, and I, I fear for this because uh, this town doesn't seem to be able to um, enforce their zoning requirements very well, i.e. across the road, a ham radio antenna is actually a cell tower. After it was put in, the building inspector said, yeah, I probably shouldn't approve that one. I.e., the Camosas construction company at the end of this road, a commercial operation which shouldn't be there. However, it's there and nobody's doing anything about it. So I don't know who's going to buy these lots or what they're going to put on them. But I want it on record that a wood burning furnace should be prohibited because it will be a serious health hazard, not to mention uh, forget what it's gonna to do to the value of the properties in the areas. Nobody's gonna to wanna to buy a house that it can't breathe the air. So that's what I have to say about that. Can I just respond for one second? Yeah. Um, Bruce, I just want you to, to know that um, it is your absolute right at any time to contact the building inspector who is the person that enforces zoning bylaws. The Zoning Board of Appeals interprets bylaws, but is not an enforcement agency. So no, no. I take, I, correct, I, we're I, not an enforcement agency in any way, shape or form. Yes, um, I, know, if there, I know. If there's a violation, mm -hmm. according to you, you are welcome at any time to contact the billing inspector and have him make a finding. I just want to make that clear. Okay, I appreciate that, Bob. He has, and I'm not, I'm not asking the zoning board to enforce prior construction projects. He, by the way, he's been contacted multiple times, but I just want to, before, before a problem becomes a reality, I want to try to avoid that. I, I, and I was hoping that there could be some stipulation pet, uh, prior to approving this project, uh, I wanted to make you guys aware of this potential situation because we don't know who's going to buy these or what they're going to do with it. Because it seems that there's no, you know, people can do whatever they want, even though it's a, it's, it's, it's zoned for residential. Um, and as I say, Todd has a wood burning furnace, but it's far enough away that it's, you know, he's, he's back in there. He doesn't have immediate neighbors. So it's far enough away. It doesn't, it doesn't affect anybody, but these houses will definitely affect Ingrid, myself, and probably the people across the street. And I, I would just, I would like to, I would like to be on record saying that there should be a prohibition against the wood burning furnace at either of those two places. Wood, wood stove, not going to tell somebody they can't have a wood stove, but a wood burning furnace is usually a year round you know, people use those things year round. They heat their hot water with them and that, and we will smell that and it will ruin our air. Do, does Waitley, uh, so Waitley allows wood burning uh, furnaces currently? As far as I can tell. 
I've never come across the issue in the town of Whaley. I actually had a case um, as a lawyer. Let's see if I can get these facts straight. Um, I represented the Conway Board of Health trying to shut down a, a wood burning furnace. This was about eight or 10 years ago. That was just over the Conway line in Ashfield. <laughs> But the smoke was coming into Conway. And so it was a jurisdictional question. It went to the housing court. But um, but they had a whole set of, Conway did, had a whole set of um, rules and regulations dealing with these furnaces. I have never seen any of those in Whaley, to tell you the truth. I think Whaley has some rules and regulations regarding wood burning furnaces but i'm sure they're allowed because there's one like i said todd has one and there's one down on uh top well, road too i believe well then maybe it's a board of health regulation um, well there are regulations but what i'm saying is that it, it you know people seem to be able to buy their lot buy, build, have their house and then just put whatever the heck they want up there and and then after it's done people seem to say oh geez probably shouldn't have let that happen so the the problem that we have, though, and I, I'm sympathetic to the smell of wood smoke, and, and I know that it does uh, bother people. And for the record, we don't even have a wood stove anymore, but that's besides the point. Um, we don't have any power in a, in a flag lot application to restrict anything about a future structure, uh, size, color, um, location, it's it's really, it is a health issue, and if it's a health issue, it would go to the Board of Health. I hate to, hate to sound like a bureaucrat, but um, but it's really outside of our, our jurisdiction, and it's certainly nothing we've ever done. Um, so, but just to follow through on it, I know you told us last time, with, with this newly configured plan, Where's your house, Bruce, in relation to, let's say, lot one, is it? I'm, I'm immediately next door to Ingrid Kennedy. He's two lots to the south, on okay. Mazda said. Two lots to the south, okay, got it. Well, yeah. the second lot to the south. Yeah. Um, think, just to yeah, and I think he owns a, a lot across the street, too, don't you, Mr. Tutton? I think you want to fly across the street. Yeah. 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 That's an investment. Yeah. Well, I don't, Roger, as from a legal standpoint, can the, the deed for these two parcels, whenever it, they're sold, can there be a deed restriction on that? And the parcel that there should be no uh, wood burning stoves can that be a condition of the deed? I don't see it as a, within our power. The, no, it's the, not. The our, owner, not. the owner who's selling it, can put a condition in a deed if the buyer agrees to accept it. But that's really a whole other. Yeah, um, I'm not asking for no wood wood burning stoves because, you know. Uh, that's going a little too far, but a wood burning furnace is a year round. They use them year round. So like I say, they heat hot water with them. So, so that smoke's coming in, you know, so you, you're going to be outside and you're going to be sucking their smoke into your lungs. Cause, cause of the way the thing drafts, if the, if, if the air drafted straight up and, and gone, I wouldn't have a problem, but it comes right down here. I would consult the Board of Health and, and then even look online, see if they have any regulations about it. But um, it's, to answer Fred's question, it's not within our power. It's just not. Um, because otherwise, otherwise, we can do all sorts of things of, of dictating future uh, development. What we're dealing with is size of a lot and, and whether it's allowed in a zone. And that's that's pure uh, zoning board territory. Planning board gets into other things, like you know, uh, how does it look? 
what kind of trees and shrubs you got to have, driveway control. That's that's more in the field of planning. I don't know if they'd have any more. Uh, Typically, it's not very restrictive for a single family home. And all these buyers are going to want to do is they're going to be allowed to do what's allowed in the zoning bylaw for the town of Whiteley and a residential lot. I mean, that's a residential designation and single family homes are by right. I mean, they can't do things that violate the zoning code. Or building code. That's an, that's or board of health. Accurate statement. Yeah. That's an accurate statement. So, you know, here in this case, what we've done uh, and without, you know, sort of in favor of one side or the other, but what we've done is we went to the town council. It seemed like there was too many lots there. Town council agreed. So we've successfully reduced by, uh, what's the math? 50% the number of lots that they're going to develop, um, or 33%, I guess. But in any event, we reduced by one the number of lots. So we've done our, our job to that extent. Otherwise, if they've met the frontage requirements, uh, the dimensional requirements, our hands are really tied. We can't predict the future. Um, and there are nuisance laws, too, even if there weren't any Florida health risks. Someone's doing something on their lot. And it's uh, preventing you from living on your property. I mean, you can frankly sue them in court, if, but, but that's, you know, it's always a crap shoot when you win the case. But um, it's really, in, in this particular instance, there's a plan. It seems to meet the requirements. It does meet the requirements. It's uh, it comply with what the town council said. You know, I like, I like, Bruce, I don't want to do anything against them, but I would vote in favor of this meets the requirements of the, of the flag on the law. And so, Bob and, and Fred, of course, are you going to vote on this one? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't have any other questions. I feel bad for Bruce and for the abutters, but um, they did come back uh, with the with the plan altered uh, according to what I always thought was the interpretation of only being allowed one flag lot. And uh, a lot of things are happening on that mountain that make me sad. Um, but I think that I, uh, I could vote on this tonight. Which one? Well, I guess I'd I'd vote in favor because it does it meets the flag lot requirement now. So Kristen or or um, Fred, who's gonna vote on this one? Fred. Fred, Fred you wanna take it? Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I would agree that it, it does meet the flag lot requirements. Uh, and I guess I'd vote in favor of it, support it. All right, so then that was a, our preliminary assessment. I'll make the make it formal then at this point. <clears throat> I'll make a motion to close the public dialogue portion of the meeting. Second. All right, and then I'll proceed to cast my vote. I vote in favor of the plan that's been submitted. Um, you got a date on this plan, Tony? Yeah, it should be down in the right-hand corner. Um, it's uh, December 1st, 2020. All right, so I vote in favor of the um, December 1st, 2020 proposed plan as uh, <coughs> allowing one flag lot in addition to the ANR lot. Um, Roger, should there be any stipulation? Uh, Tony's still waiting for some approval, which um, is. Yes, numerous approvals, actually. Numerous Chicago. approvals. Yeah, so we would have to come back if there's a change to the flag lot. Um, and I'm okay with a condition that states that, Bob. I would, yeah, I would like to include that as a, a order of condition that um, that they get all of those approvals and don't make, don't make any changes to the December 1st plan. Okay, sure. No, well, so what, yes, in that case. 
Should I just be listing for the record that to include all remaining state approvals or do I need to list individual ones? I would just, I would suggest that if the dimensional criteria of the flag lot changes that we would be required to come back before the board to discuss those changes. I think it's pretty set, but uh, you're dealing with a state, so anything can happen. Well, I, I kind of need to hear from the ZBA about yeah. what supposed to, what what they want for <laughs> for the condition to say. All right. Well, well I mean, I just, I, go ahead. Uh, well, if if any if any of the uh, state approvals change the, as Tony said, change the uh, dimensional aspects of the flag lot, then they've got to come back. Mm -hmm. Any state approvals change the dimensional aspects of the, lot. of the plan dated December 1st, 2020. Yes. If that's okay with you guys. Yes. Yeah, fine. All right, so I cast my vote in favor of the December 1st, 2020 proposed plan on the condition that the dimensions don't change based on any changing state approvals. I cast my vote, yes. I'll cast my vote, yes. Okay, that's it. We'll, we'll draft it up. And uh, at the end of this hearing, I understand there's another matter, but I'm accused from that particular. Excuse me for a moment, just to wind up on this. If there were any state approvals that changed the dimensional aspects of this plan, the applicant would have to return to which entity? Was it a commission? Yes, this the zoning board. board. Oh, the zoning board. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you. That's, I'm done with that. Okay. Thank you all. I thank you for your patience on this project. Um, and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Okay. Thanks, John. Good night. All right. I'm going to sign off. Bob's going to be the chair for the um, informal presentation that I understand is next. So I'll, uh, I'll be in touch with the board members in terms of drafting and signing the um, uh, the three decisions <laughs> that we made tonight. Okay. Good, Good evening. You, uh, your microphone is muted, Mr. Herbert. Your microphone is muted. Yeah. There you no, are. No longer. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm Bob Smith and I'm chairing this uh, discussion you. tonight. And uh, Fred Orlowski and Kristen Vivon will be um, participating in it as well. Not really, uh, I'd love to have you explain exactly what you're expecting from us tonight because I have some concerns if it's one thing and I don't have concerns if it's another. We have two um, things that we'd like to discuss. First, this is Agnes Ting and she is going to be doing a self storage on the parcel six up near the truck stop. That will be about a third of the area or maybe a little more. And we are, um, excuse my backdrop, I'd like to be in the tropics, but uh, I teach tropical <laughs> agriculture. I told my class I took off for the tropics because it was too cold. <laughs> but, um, and we'd like to do uh, growing cannabis on this lot. The lot is zoned commercial and there is only one abutting home anywhere near the lot within the 300 feet and no churches and no schools, but there is the town uh, beach across 91, uh, which would like a waiver uh, for the 500 foot setback um, that is granted in the zoning bylaws that you can request that. We think this is justifiable because uh, if you look from the town beach, and I could show you a picture of that, um, you can't see across it because 91 
is elevated a good 20 feet, I estimate, above uh, the um, level of the town beach. And the same on the other side at the grow site. So the grow site is not visible. And furthermore, um, no, it, both sides of 91 are, are fence, and nobody would be smart in walking across 91 dodging traffic. So um, we think this is a justifiable uh, request for a waiver. Okay, so um, am I to understand that you are actually applying for a waiver, but we have no, are you, or is this simply a discussion tonight? This is a discussion because we, okay. we haven't formally um, uh, done the application. We've, we've done, filled out the form and I've paid the fee, and then we would uh, go back and, and do all of the points listed in 171, something is that right. I really forget, but right. whatever it is in the zoning bylaws. There's about, so last time we had 18 different points that we um, had in our verbiage, which uh, was signed off on. Right. Well, um, I think. You, did you you submit uh, the application? Yes. Okay, so, I mean, now I'm a little bit confused because if we're having a discussion, that's one thing, but if there's a submitted application, I need to know from Mary, was the application, was the this meeting advertised for 14 days ahead of time? Are we actually... No. We have to... No. So, in other words, it's it's probably not a good idea to have submitted this, correct? I don't um, know. <laughs> well, um, I, I don't know what the rest of the board thinks. We have, um, I have in front of me an application for cultivation and a request for a waiver. Um, and I would consider it an incomplete application. Now, I don't know whether you'd like to withdraw this piece of paper without prejudice or whether you want us to act on what I have received, uh, in which case I would vote to declare it an incomplete application and that could have ramifications. So um, I don't know how, how do other members feel. If we're just having a discussion, that's one thing, but I don't know what to do with this piece of paper and whether it starts the clock ticking. I checked with the town clerk this morning and this paper was filed this morning. So the application technically has been filed but we haven't advertised it as a meeting. So I don't know what that means to us. Do you understand my dilemma? I understand it. And we intended it first and foremost to be an informal discussion tonight. Okay. okay. So we'll just make that assumption. And since yeah. that was filed today at the town clerk's office, Mary's going to have to deal with advertising and all that for a future meeting, correct? Correct. All right. So... Fred and Kristen, is there anything you'd like to say about um, what we've just heard? Well, I don't know if we've seen the proposal what's being developed there. Has that been submitted? A, a plan? I know you you tried. The, appli you tried to the get application a has gone in, but no proposal has gone in yet. So uh, I, I guess we can't act on anything without seeing what you're proposing to, to, to do there. Uh, the the my, my thoughts to just right now is uh, the, our zoning talks. There's distinctions between open field cultivation and greenhouse cultivation, and I your I don't know what your application says. You need to be specific on what you're going to do there. Just to say to cultivate, to me, it, it's not acceptable. You need to be more specific. Are you going to put, establish or construct greenhouses there? Because I know there's no greenhouses there today. Or are you going to do open field? And that's different requirements for, for zoning. Uh, Correct. For bylaws. We're, yeah, we, we will um, put in a formal application of all of the points that are covered in the bylaws. Okay. And I just downloaded the form off the... Uh, ZBA website and thought that we should get that in to start the process rolling. And I guess 
I didn't expect us to do anything um, as a vote or anything tonight um, until you see the, the full application. Okay, so, but, but again, you need to be specific. What do you, what do you cultivate? We will be, I, we so, will have very specific things. Okay, and the other thing, somewhere I, I saw you're asking for a waiver of 300 feet and that, that is, I think, in our bylaw somewhere. Uh, I would encourage you to, to take a close look at where 300 feet appears on that property or on I-91, you're more than 300 feet. My, to my measurement, you're more than 300 feet from uh, right. the Tritown Beach. The, the right of way for I-91 is, is more than 300 feet. So I guess to say you want a 300 foot waiver puts it in the middle of 91 and you can't no, um, get that close. And, and I, I would suggest you look at the, the property line for the property you're proposing and buying and look at the setbacks that you have to be for that property line and then measure that distance to Triton Beach. You're gonna be well over 300 feet. Correct. So the, the way it's written is that the distance should be 500 feet. Right. We're not 500 feet, so we are falling back to the restriction being 300 feet if a waiver is granted. Not, and that doesn't say anything about how far we are, as long as we exceed, as long as the Tri-County Beach is beyond 300 feet. I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that when you present an entire plan, we'll be able to thoughtfully look at uh, no. the request for, for a waiver. Because as you know, we have granted one such request um, in the recent past, which doesn't mean um, because the law, the bylaw says that it is specifically our yes. choice to the specific applicant. I understand. Um, right. And we would expect also um, some word on the host community agreement because we have in the past had applicants arrive to discuss marijuana growing or retail sales without having the host community agreement in place. Yeah. Um, and we've sent them, we've sent them back um, and put them off, you know, postponed for a month or so. So we would definitely, definitely want to hear about your um, uh, host community agreement situation with uh, um, the select board, board. Of select board, the select yeah. board. Um, and then uh, definitely would like to see uh, some sort of uh, surveyed uh, precise measurements of everything. And, and as Fred suggested, indoor versus outdoor. And then of course, the issue of having two separate uses on the same lot. Um, I don't know if, uh, if we've ever thought we, we would have to look at that because one, one use would be the self storage facility and the other use would be marijuana cult cultivation. So we just, we would need to look at our bylaws and, and um, make sure that there's no, I don't think there's a, a problem with the multi-use, but we need to think about it. And of course the abutters all need to be contacted and whoever controls Tritown. Is that the select boards of Sunderland and Waitley? No, there's, there's a Tritown Beach Commission. Okay. We would just, we would, you know, they need to be notified as, and that's, um, uh, Part of the application process is the notification of, of a butters. Yes. Um, and um, I just, those are the only things that I can think of. Right. Uh, and in our application, we will put from the um, Waitley GIS axis the 300 foot abutter okay. um, thing. Okay. And that doesn't list Tri County as one of the abutters. So really? that means they're outside the 300 foot. Oh, okay. 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 So we'll put that in the application so it clarifies okay. that too. All right. Is there any is there anything else, uh, Kristen or Fred, that you can think of that we want to make sure that we we have? Oh, you well, you got a pretty tough act to follow in terms of odor mitigation. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um because we'll you be concerned. Off, uh, you signed off on that for us once before. And we're yes. using the same sort of odor mitigation. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I don't remember who voted on, uh, on that, but um, I think you were there. <laughs> yeah, I was there. And I, 
since this was just a, an informal discussion, yeah. in all likelihood, if your application appears for the April meeting, it would be the vice chair, Deborah Carney, who would be um, chairing the meeting because I'm the clerk. I got elevated because <laughs> no one, no one, no one's left. Um, yeah. So she would be actually chairing the um, <coughs> the hearings. Um, I just wanted you to, to know that. But as tonight, Roger can't. So yeah. um, I yeah. stepped in just for this discussion purposes. Is there anything else that you would? Um, the, the only other thing that we will do the formal application with all the details as we've done before. But for the self-storage, what is required for Ms. Ting to um, make an application? Does she have to, to get a site approval for that? Uh, you know, well, that's I a great... say that I think you do, but. Well, let me just look in the table of uses for a second yeah. and uh, you can uh, talk among yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything in there. You can look, Bob, but I, I looked. I, I didn't On self storage. There's no. So is it allowed by right? No, I don't think so. I don't think so because we, uh, the self storage that's that's over by the um, wax barn. We right. we met on that. and We had to decide about um, Evans. Russ Evans runs that one. Owns that one. Oh. So let me just look at the table of use regulations, page five. It's hard to find, actually, though. It really is. It's always hard to find in this. It's a <laughs> stupid way of doing it. Yeah, we have marijuana under agriculture, but it's not agriculture. Correct. Yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, you know, there's a catch all. The last one on page 11 talks about other principal uses with appearance, operation, parking may impact the. Yeah, I mean that's the catch-all. That is a uh, in commercial, industrial is a special permit is required. As I remember seeing it, it was up near the top of a page. The easiest thing to do would be to um, um, run it up the flagpole with the building inspector, and if he gives you a permit, you don't need us. If he says okay. you got to go to the ZBA, he does. Uh, okay. You do need us. That that would be, I mean, that's what we pay him to do. Yeah. So. When we do our site plan with the um, architect drawer, uh, he's going to do it for both at the same time. He'll show it in relation. So that part will be done. Um, and I think it all, all it says is a site plan is needed. Okay. Yeah, right now I can't find it in particular. I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep looking. And if I find something, I will contact um, Mary to contact you. Yep. that I found some, something in particular. But my suggestion would be to go to the building inspector and, um, yep. and he should be able to tell you whether it's a, a go or whether you need a, some sort of special permit. Yep. What, el what else, folks? I think we're good. We know what you want from us. And yeah. my apologies if you thought that we thought we were going to get more than we're getting tonight. I didn't intend that. Okay. I knew we had to do a formal... Uh, verbiage right. right out. And, well, you can understand. Was... You can understand my confusion. Yes, with, yes, with and, seeing, yeah. And I yeah, saw. And, and I was just trying to get something in so we could get yeah. on the agenda. That was all. Okay. Okay. So, Stephen, I guess I missed, uh, and I don't know if you went through your PowerPoint on Monday, but I guess I'd like to see the PowerPoint if you could see. Yes. It um, if you go to Urban Grown Inc. Urban Grown Inc. Okay. Dot com on the web. We have a web page there. And in the middle at the top of there, there's a link to that meeting. And um, the PowerPoint is up there with two slides per page. Okay. Um, also, I, I believe that, Mary, we need physical documents for our records. So whatever you produce um, as, as your presentation with maps and diagrams and charts and so forth, um, it needs to be, um, is it okay now, Mary, to do it electronically or does it have to be? Uh, we, well, we really, we really need it electronically because need it electronically. See them otherwise, but right. uh, physical documents still need to be 
delivered to town hall, either okay. by some shipper or uh, some other way, because people we can put them in that mailbox. See them. Well, you can't, well, you can't get, get in there. there. Here's here's the current arrangement. Uh, town halls closed right now, so they do they probably won't fit in the outside box. But the uh, vestibule is being left open for other things to be dropped off. Also, you can call the town clerk or email her and ask her to meet you there. Uh, yeah. She has been doing that for people too. Okay. Um, yeah. And then uh, electronic copies, if you could send uh, them to Mary and Mary would distribute it, distribute them to the zoning board. Right. You, you, can, you may have my uh, email address by now, but you can also I think I do. to zba at, wakely, at waitley dot com. But I can do it there as well. That goes to you. Works also. Either one works. Yeah. OK. And I just want to let you know ahead of time that if you if there are changes that you make to your plans along the way once the hearings get going uh the town clerk is going to need updated copies of those plans uh, yes. we we need to see the updated copies in electronic form for the hearings also sure and uh we don't have all of that done because we only had the foreman so right. we'll be developing that and when we get it done we hope that it will be near final that we present to you. Do okay. you anticipate uh, April or May or? We'd like to get on the April agenda if we can. Well, if you submit the application with the materials then uh, and give Mary enough time to, she needs 14 days for posting. Um, yeah, so, so we'd have, yeah, so we'd have a couple like, of we, yeah. we, Three weeks ahead is really much better because I need time to put together the ad and submit it to the newspaper, they have to print it yeah. on the two Thursdays preceding the uh, hearing. So I need to get it really soon. Yeah, I understood. If we want to do it. The, the next Thursday, the regular April meeting is April 1st. So yeah. it already has to be printed in the paper on the two preceding Thursdays. Yeah. So, and once I send it to them, you know, the, the newspapers are low on personnel these days. They need time to get it all set up and send me a proof. I have to proofread it, call for any corrections that need to be made. And the deadlines, you know, are, you know, they, they need a, a few days to get everything in place. Yeah, so we will, we will communicate with you. If we can make the April one, we will. If we can't, we'll let you know. Okay. Okay, Very so good. If, 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 by, if by three, well, I don't know, it's almost three weeks ahead of Yeah, school. I know. That's why. You may not be able to do it for we'll April. You know. uh, but make sure that Lynn has everything that she needs at the town clerk's office. And yes, I have her email address. She will, you have it. Yeah. And her, uh, you can always call her to the, the number is on, on the website for the town. Yeah. Uh, she has been willing to go meet people. Uh, in the parking lot. That's what things are. <laughs> That's the yeah. array these days. 665 4400 extension three. Yeah. Next week I get my second um, jab in the arm. So. Oh, good for you. <laughs> good. I hope you're any, all doing it. Uh, does yeah. anybody else have any questions? Okay. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you in some more formal fashion. Thank you. And thanks for entertaining us a little bit tonight. Okay.